Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, one of the big topics that we're seeing at the moment is businesses attempting to meet ESG benchmarks as it's becoming a, a requirement, not simply a goal for most businesses. So when I read that Accenture is sharing its own sustainability roadmap, including priorities, learnings and best practices, so I wanted to find out more about that, along with some of the research that they found that most CEOs are listing becoming a sustainable and responsible business as a top priority, even back in the height of the COVID pandemic. So Accenture CIO Penelope Pret, she created a strategy that focuses on three key pillars. So I invited her on the podcast to explore these in more detail with me today. So buckle up and hold on tight because no matter where you're listening in the world, I'm going to beam your ears all the way to the US where Penelope is waiting to join us today. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Penelope. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Uh, thanks again for having me, Neil, and it's great to be here today. Um, I am the very long title coming at you, Chief Information Digital and Analytics Officer of Accenture, which means I am essentially accountable for all of the technology that runs Accenture and all of the data that underpins that technology. It is a terrific job and a very exciting time uh, to be working in IT and data. And it's a it's a great job title, and I'm looking forward to finding out much more about what you're doing there. But before I do, I always like to take my guests back in time. So just for a moment, can I take you back, and can you remember where your passion for tech came from, or the moment that put you on the path you're on today, and what, and what lit that spark in you? I don't know if it's any one big moment, Neil, yeah. but there have been thousands of tiny, incredibly powerful moments in my life when I really felt viscerally how technology can change the way the world works and lives. Let me just give you a couple of examples. I was doing an internship in uh, 1986 when I got my first gander at Apple computers and having come from the world of DOS and thinking of essentially uh, personal computing as a high-end geek function, right? Of somebody who's incredibly specialized and spent many years studying I suddenly was struck with the knowledge that any person, anywhere, anytime, would be able to use this very powerful technology. And it was a transformative moment for me to think about the fact that I can be part of that. And I'll give you another very simple, more recent one. My grandmother became a shut-in in the later years of her life. And she was struggling with depression, being alone. And I got her an iPad and she was able to FaceTime and all of a sudden, it was like the whole world opened up and her entire tone and way of living changed much more positive and engaged. And it was an enrichment technology for her that really transformed how she saw the world. Those are just a couple of small examples, but you can see these tiny things adding up to really visually understanding how we in tech can help the world change the way it works and lives. You really can. And that, the second story there in particular is incredibly powerful and shows you the, the power of technology. I always say technology works best when it brings people together. And that's a great example of that. And, and for yourself, this path led you to Accenture. And as meeting ESG benchmarks becomes a requirement, not simply a goal for most businesses around the world, Accenture recently shared its own sustainability roadmap. So can you tell me a little bit more about these benchmarks? Sure. And every company's benchmarks are different, but we all follow the GSSB and the GRI standards and so on. But at Accenture, we have a couple, three big goals that particularly in technology, I really am a large part of moving the goalposts forward, right? Um, number one, we've committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2025. And we're focusing first on actual reductions across scope one, two, and three, doing things like planning to meet office energy needs with 100% renewable electricity by 2023, requiring 90% of our key suppliers to disclose their targets and how they are actively moving to address their emissions um, and things like that. We're also moving to zero waste, where we'll reuse or recycle 100% of our e-waste, computers, servers, as well as office furniture and things like that by 2025. And we're also planning for water risk. And this is one of the newer goals where we're looking to develop plans to reduce the impact of things like flooding, drought, and water scarcity on our businesses and on Accenture's people in high-risk areas. 
and we're looking at the overall use of water by the company and how we can reduce uh, across the world. And, you know, these are lofty goals, but it's really real. Neil, let me just give you a couple of examples of what we've actually been able to do. Sure. We have reduced as a company our core carbon emissions per employee by more than 65 percent against the baseline we started tracking in 2006, 65 percent. Wow. At the end of fiscal 21, our renewable energy mix was at 53 percent, which is up from 30 percent in 2020, a change in just one year. And we continue to work with 100% renewable electricity by location, looking to be able to power those sites by 2023. Uh, we're also looking at, in general, how to avoid e-waste, because we all know that's a huge environmental problem right now. And right now, more than 99% of our total e-waste avoided a landfill. We dispose of our hardware, for example, in a responsible way, and we're going to hit 100 by 2025. That last percent is the longest. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. And before you came on the podcast today, I was doing a little bit of research on my own, and I came across a, a research post from Accenture that found that most CEOs are listing becoming a sustainable and responsible business as a top priority. And I'm, I'm curious, is these small and large enterprises, or is it right across the board that you're seeing this? From where I sit, what I personally see, yep. it's across the board. And I think the study you're referring to is the climate leadership in the 11th hour between the United yep. Nations Global Compact and Accenture's CEO study group. That's right. uh, yeah. And so if you look at just the mix of people in there, there's over 1,200 CEOs who are consulted from a full range of companies, not just of every size, but more importantly, Neil, from every industry, because we all know that some industries are more advanced in this and some industries are still a little bit behind the times and seeking to catch up in their sustainability goals. But top to bottom, there is a general commitment across the world to address this and to address it now. And one of the things that I'm noticing here, and a bit of a prediction, but it feels like ESG could become a huge disruptor for businesses because socially aware consumers and enterprises alike could eventually turn their back on companies that just don't take sustainability seriously. I'm curious, is this a message that boardrooms are getting or are you still seeing a little resistance at the moment? Uh, I don't think I personally, and the other CIOs I talk to and other C-suite executives, see any resistance. If you think about the average company today, pressure comes from three sectors. It comes from the talent they're trying to hire, and more and more the talent is becoming aware of sustainability goals and seeking companies that can meet their own needs for delivering sustainability for the planet. Uh, the shareholders who, you know, prop up the value of the company. It's important to them that they see meaningful progress in this arena. And of course, the clients that you serve, they all have their own sustainability goals and they're not going to do business with a partner that will not help them move forward. So I don't think it's a question of being committed. I think it's a question of not really knowing how to get started. This is a wide, vast landscape. It's incredibly confusing all kinds of market messages. So while companies may see a sound business case for making technology more sustainable, for example, they just don't know how to start. And I think if you talk to most CIOs, what they'll tell you is there's three key things they think about. How do I measure any of this? Is the data there? How do I get it? What do I do with it? How do I manage the investments I've already made in hardware and even software on legacy architectures that is not really performing in a sustainable way. And what do I do about the lack of awareness across my company? I feel like I'm pulling the wagon all by myself. And what I usually tell them is keep it simple. Don't overreach. When you start, just think about three basic things. Set your baseline with the data you have. Because knowing where you're starting, even if you only know part of the story, is an important thing to be able to track progress and to feel positive about the direction you're going. Make sustainability part of your everyday language. Every kind of governance you have, every meeting with shareholders, with stakeholders, start with a sustainable moment. The more you bring the language into the everyday vernacular company, the more it becomes an embroiled part of how people think, right? Yeah. And then finally... You have to involve everyone in this journey. This is not a journey that any one department or one part of a company can take on its own. It takes an entire village to make these things happen. And you have to have shared interests, continually talk about your goals and rope in partners to help you with this stuff if you want to get your company on the right footing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I'd love to bring it back to Accenture just for a moment. Can you tell me a little bit more about your strategy that, that you've created here that focuses on these three pillars? 
Well, we, I would not be a, a consultant by trade if I didn't have three pillars. <laughs> <laughs> they are uh, pretty simple. The first one is you have to have sustainability by technology, which is just using technology innovation to actually drive sustainability initiatives and to transform your business models to operate on a more sustainable footing. Let me give you a very specific example of that. At Accenture, we worked over the last couple of years to transform our finance function to port all of our finance technology into the cloud, to streamline our operations. And we've actually moved our month end closes and our annual closes from a period that exceeded two weeks in some cases to about five business days, right? And that means less resources, less compute time, more efficiency, overall a more sustainable process. It also has incredible business benefit, which is almost incidental, right? But it has a positive impact on sustainability. It's a great example of thinking about how to innovate across your tech spectrum to actually change the business to be more sustainable at the core. The second kind of tenant is sustainability in technology, not by tech, but in tech, being able to measure and to manage the measurements of what you're doing. So as an example, at Accenture, we were measuring our carbon footprint and we specifically moved out of a data center and into a cloud footprint using all three of the major hyperscalers to help us manage our sustainability footprint on carbon emissions. And of course, for every CIO, that first time migration to the cloud is your first huge jump and probably the single largest bang for the buck that you can get on an IT sustainability agenda. And then you get into the cloud and you learn to tune it very specifically in the last couple of years, We've taken 220 metric tons of carbon out of our IT carbon emissions footprint just by getting smarter about how we leverage the power of the cloud. So it's real money and it's really achievable by any company. And then kind of the third tenant we talk about is sustainability at scale. And this is the concept we talked about just a minute ago, Neil, where nobody can do it alone alone being a single company as well as a single individual. And so we at Accenture believe you have to orchestrate an ecosystem of businesses, technology companies, partners, startups, nonprofits, everybody across the gamut in order to really be able to harness these technologies effectively and drive world change. And as an example in that space, uh, Accenture, GitHub, Microsoft, and ThoughtWorks have founded the Green Software Foundation. We did that in 2021. And it's a nonprofit organization with the Linux Foundation and the Joint Development Foundation projects that helps to essentially build a trusted ecosystem of people, standards, tooling, practices for building green software. So if a CIO wants to understand how they can contribute to the cause, you can take a look at what the Green Software Foundation is using and the standards they're coming up with, and you can apply that to your everyday life in your shop. Today's podcast sponsor is Nextiva. Nextiva takes the hassle out of communicating with customers and your team. If you need to send a text, Nextiva One can do that. Need to send an important email, Nextiva One does that too. Need to start an internal chat with your meetings and phone calls? Yep, you got it. It's built right into Nextiva One. But the real game changer here is what Nextiva calls threaded conversations. Threaded conversations let you see an entire call and messaging history regardless of the tool that you use to communicate. So go to nextiva.com slash tech talk daily and you can start experiencing the simplicity that Nextiva One could bring to your business. And for any business leaders listening that are considering making a shortcut or exaggerate in their sustainability efforts, one thing we are also seeing a lot of this year is more and more brands being called out for greenwashing. So do you have any advice for leaders listening on how they can deliver the promise of sustainable technology and avoid being called out for greenwashing in the process too? Well, greenwashing is an integrity issue, right? Yeah. And when you're talking about sustainability, integrity is part of the footprint. We are all not going to make change unless we honestly and transparently lean in together to make that change. So if you're moving your sustainability agenda forward, some simple things to think about. Number one, have a learning plan. The reason people might misstate something, maybe it's not intentional, maybe it's because they really don't understand the footing you're trying to move to or what the sustainability goals mean. So teach them, have a very deliberate company-wide learning plan, right? Accenture has 
modules that we use, we have point of service learning, and we continue to reinforce that learning through how we present our digital experiences to the company so that you can see, for example, your carbon emissions when you're making travel requirements. This is the kind of thing that brings the company language and vernacular up a whole level and gets everyone thinking the same. You involve your people. Let me give you a very specific example. At Accenture, we do something called the Innovation Challenge. It's brand new. We put it in in 2021. And it's essentially an opportunity for entrepreneurs and big thinkers to bring forward their ideas about how to create a sustainable economy. More than 2,300 of our practitioners came forward and brought ideas with clients, with startups, with nonprofits across seven critical topics, everything from circular packaging, I think it was, to rewilding land. And the amount of energy and innovative thinking that it created in the company around the topic of sustainability is something we're still riding the energy wave off of a full year later. And then the, the other thing I might say in this space, Neil, is uh, you got to know your data. And it's not hard to make material progress against a footprint. If you know what the footprint is, you understand the variables that go into it and you begin to press those variables and actually showing your, your movement up from your baseline is a much more powerful thing than greenwashing or making a claim that's baseless or doesn't have any facts in it. When I talk to you about taking out 220 metric tons of carbon, it's real and I can prove it. And that's so much more profound than fancy words that really don't move the sustainability agenda forward. 100% with you on that. And for any business leader listening that still might be sat on the fence, what would you say is the ROI of delivering a higher sustainability performance? Because that's the message that will, will hit boardrooms or a lot of them. Well, there's a really good study out there from Accenture, which you can access on our website, but the nuts and bolts of it is quite simple. What we found is that companies with high environmental, social, and governance performance outperform their peers, achieving 3.7 times higher operating margins and 2.6 times higher shareholder return. The proof is in the data. Companies that pay attention to sustainability outperform other companies consistently. But... Neil, I also think you have to think about uh, flipping the question. ROI is important, right? We want to make investments. We want to see return on investments. But I believe that this is one of those cases where there's a much higher negative ROI of not doing anything. Why? Because as we talked about earlier, the people you're hiring, your talent, they demand it. Clients who want to buy your goods don't want you to bring down their sustainability position. They want you to improve it. So they care shareholders care, right? And when all these external groups are looking at you and your answer is, well, I haven't done anything, how do you think that plays against a professional competitor who can say, hey, I took 220 metric tons out of the environment, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you really have to think about not only the positive ROI, but the negative ROI of sitting still. It's just not acceptable for the average company today. Such a powerful moment to end on. But before I let you go, we started the podcast talking about your origin story, what put you on this path. And as we've now reached full circle, I'm going to ask you to reflect for a moment and look back at your career and share maybe the funniest or most interesting story that happened to you. Is there anything that springs to mind? Well, I think the funniest and most powerful Accenture career story that I have is my very first assignment with Accenture. Um, I grew up pretty typical American. I'd been around the world, seen a few things, but I wasn't hugely widely traveled. And I was looking forward to experiencing different parts of the globe. And the first thing that Accenture did is to staff me in Papua New Guinea, specifically in Irian Jaya, in a mining camp to work on an ore collection system. It was new software that had been developed and they needed some uh, testing and functionality help. And they flew me around the world and put me on this island. And in watching what was happening with 50,000 miners, this mining operation, me being by myself on that side of the world, it was an eye-opening experience. Neil, there were funny moments where I simply could not believe some of the things I was seeing because I had never seen anything like it before. There were sobering moments when I came to understand, really understand, that the rest of the world maybe didn't live the same way that we did. But most importantly, when you have a formative career experience like that very early, you're never afraid of anything. Where are you going to send me or what are you going to ask me to do that is going to be more disruptive 
to my personal worldview than the very first thing I did with Accenture. And it made me unafraid. I want the new challenges. I want to try new things. There's nothing you can throw at me that's going to intimidate me because I've been there, done that. And I've got the T-shirt and it says New Guinea. Wow, absolutely love that. Again, such a powerful story. And for anyone listening that would like to dig a little bit deeper on anything we've talked about today, we've referenced several reports, and I appreciate Accenture is a pretty big website. So if anyone wants to look a little bit deeper or contact your team or anything like that, what's the best starting point for everything around the topic we've talked about today? Just go into Accenture.com and in the search bar, click sustainability, and you will get more readables than you could ever want. Neil, we have a ton of data, market research, facts and figures that will help everyone get started on their sustainability journey. Well, we covered so much in a short amount of time today about delivering on the promise of sustainable technology means that people like CIOs must embed sustainability into the core of operations to help the business achieve sustainability goals while also managing the environmental impact of the technology itself. So many big talking points and all that washed down with a couple of great stories by you and your origin story for bringing it all to life. So thank you so much for sharing that with me today. Thank you, Neil. There were some great insights there, especially around those three pillars, you know, data and sustainability commitments require greater access to sustainability data, as well as environmental sustainability reporting tools. And then around cloud optimization and the realisation that optimization migrations to the public cloud can actually reduce global carbon emissions by 59 million tonnes of CO2 per year. And then on the topic of value chains and driving supplier engagement through data platforms and procurement hubs in order to influence responsible buying decisions and help businesses optimise their supplier base. But the big question now is you've heard from me, you've heard from Penelope, but what are you and your business doing or what are you not doing? Are you taking it seriously? Are you not? I want to hear stories from all sides here and from all over the world. So I invite you to email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, slide into the DMs over on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, just at Neil C. Hughes. We'll keep this conversation going. And I'll also return again tomorrow with another guest, another topic, and another industry. So hopefully you'll join me again then. But a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Oh,